Okay, we have a little time, so I thought I'd give just the briefest, <laughs> sorry, just the briefest introduction, not to, um, not to the hyperbolic trig functions, which I said we might, uh, might do yesterday, but to differential equations. So this is in the textbook. It's just stuff that normally gets skipped for time. Um, before I do, you know, finishing up, right, right where we ended yesterday, we were looking at partial fractions, and we've seen what happens when we have linear cases. If the linear terms are all different, that's great. If we have like, if we have something like this, we're in a golden position um, because we can, first of all, find the partial fraction decomposition easily, well, easily in scare quotes, to the extent that anything in the calculus is easy, we can find the partial fraction decomposition with the heavy side method. And then we can integrate both of these things. It's a small u substitution, but it ends up being the natural log. That was what I called case one. And then in case two, I said, well, maybe maybe we have these linear terms, but some of them are repeated. And that's kind of a not great case if you're doing stuff by hand. Because the heavy side method doesn't work here. But it is a good case. I mean, if you're willing to um, well, you don't, I, I was about to say, well, you don't strictly need technology to find A, B, C, and D, but you really kind, I mean, in, in linear algebra, where we learn to solve systems of linear equations, we learn to do it using our calculator. If there are more than like three equations and three unknowns, doing it by hand is a pain. In, um, so you really sort of do need technology, but it's it's a good case from another point of view. We can't find A, B, C, and D easily, but if we're thinking of this as an integration tool, we can integrate all of those terms. Going back to something I said yesterday, be a little careful. Some of these, the first one and the second one, will give us natural logarithms. Others will give us powers.
So here, if we let u be x minus four, I mean, th these are u substitutions you'd often do in your head when du equals dx. But I also don't want to encourage that if anyone's struggling. You know, you can write, well, we'll let u be this, we'll let du be that. Then we've got u to the negative two, negative two bumps up to negative one. We divide by negative one. So we can integrate all of these cases. <laughs> so bad in the sense that finding A, B, C, and D is a hassle, Good in the sense that we're doing this as an integration tool and the integration works out. That leaves us with a case where we might have a quadratic that doesn't factor. Um, having a quadratic that doesn't factor is the same as saying having a quadratic that doesn't have real roots. And if you hit that quadratic with the um, quadratic form to the, you would find that it has no roots. So partial fractions is very modular. I mean, here we have this linear thing. And it's going to give us a term that looks like this, just the way it did, you know, when we had the linear term by itself here, or when we had the linear terms by themselves there. This quadratic, I'll just like the linear terms will show up in the denominator of a fraction. But unlike the linear case, we have an ax plus b up there. We have two constants and an x. And this is a bad case, I mean, if I can say that. Um, first of all, because finding that capital A, that lowercase a, and that lowercase b is going to be a hassle. The, um, the heavy side method is, again, not going to work. We'll have to write out all of the equations and set the coefficients equal to each other. But also, on a, I would say, a more fundamental level, there's no particular reason you should be able to integrate. Something that looks like this. I mean, in fact, I would say that 99 times out of 100, you can't, I mean. 2x minus 1 over 3x squared plus 4x minus 2. Well, what are you going to do with that? You probably start by saying, well, what if I let you be the denominator, but that's an, that's an extremely specialized case. Sorry, I, I get sort of sloppy. I mean, if instead of 2x minus 1, we had 6x plus 4 up here, great, we'd be golden. We can do u substitution. But 
we don't. So, and then we think, I don't know. I mean, I guess the next thing I think is, well, what if you rewrote this? as a product and try to hit it with integration by parts. But again, that just doesn't work. I mean, if we, if we were using parts here, it probably that U be that and D V be this. And if it weren't for that negative one, we would be able to do this, but the negative one's there, so we can't find V. So we sort of, I mean, shrug. I mean, I, I can't guarantee that, you know, there's not some clever way I'm missing here, but it sure looks like we can't integrate that linear over that quadratic. And obviously that's the worst case. You have to work hard to do the partial fraction decomposition. And then after the partial fraction decomposition, you're still stuck. Great. Well, just, I guess, just for the matter of sort of for the record, you know, so we've looked at all four cases. I say this is the worst case. That's optimistic. It's the second to worst case. The real worst case would be. if you had this raised to a power. And the, uh, the way that would break down is very similar to how things break down. <laughs> when we have a linear term raised to a power. So we start with just the unfactorable quadratic by itself, and then we count up until we reach our power here, then See, a1x plus b1, a2x plus b2, a3x plus b3, a4x plus b4. But, um, but this is not going to work. I mean, your textbook will give examples where it works, but that's because the textbook author is um, <clears throat> spending a significant amount of time making sure that all of his examples are doable by hand which maybe um, maybe ends up giving kind of a distorted view of the material. Um, when I say it's not going to work, what I mean is if you try to use this as an integration tool, you'll wind up with a bunch of integrals that you are not able to take. So that's partial fraction decomposition.
And I always think we're going to spend more time that um, you, we spend more time than we do on integration techniques in this class, but this is the re last real integration technique we're going to learn. So if we... <laughs> This did them out. There's U substitution and there's um integration by parts. There's a special technique for powers of trig functions, there's a special technique for rational functions, and then there's a specialized technique for dealing with specific types. of square roots. And as far as writing, as far as integrating by hand and getting a finite answer that you can write down, this is pretty much it. It's not like you go to graduate school and then they teach you all the advanced integration that you didn't learn in calculus. This is how I know to integrate. I mean, there are other techniques, but the other techniques are very different. The other techniques involve infinite sums and series, and we're going to have to develop quite the background in the second half of this class before we can talk about those. So of these, I mean, powers of trade functions get used for powers of trig functions. It's kind of right there in the name. Partial fractions are a tool for dealing with rational functions. Trig substitution is a very specialized tool for dealing with certain square roots. Integration by parts is a tool for dealing with products, although it requires the products to be pretty specialized. And then you substitution is kind of a wild card. I mean, it gets presented as a tool for dealing with compositions, but sometimes you do it as a tool for dealing with products. Sometimes you use it as a tool for dealing with quotients. If we we go back here, I um dealt with this quotient by doing a quick U substitution. And that's where we're at. And I mean, I've said that, I mean, I've been pretty upfront, I think, that it can be a pain to integrate by hand. I think I've probably said this, but if not, I should probably be explicit. It's very common for none of these techniques to work, and then you just can't take the antiderivative. 
And in that situation, we don't have to despair. Thanks to modern technology, there are all sorts of ways to approximate integrals or to, um, to get graphs of what the integrals look like, even if you can't write down an equation for them. But like, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, I just made fun of the textbook for lab growing its examples. I'm not talking about like super obscure lab grown cases. Here's a very straightforward function. It's a composition between a sine and a one over X. And as for that integral, we can't take it using any techniques of this book. If we want that integral, we have a few options. <clears throat> um, especially, you know, if we have a definite integral, we'll see that we have a bunch of options for numerically approximating it. If we do not have that those limits of integration, if we just have an indefinite integral, there are also ways of approximating it, but those will require more background and we'll come back to them at the end of this course. So before I move on to something else, does anybody have any questions? I mean, about the material I cover today, but also more broadly about the integration techniques. 